So My name is Annie Duke. I'm a former professional poker player and cognitive scientist. I speak and consult uh, in decision strategy in the decision-making space, and I also uh, write in that space. I've written three books uh, for general audiences. The first is Thinking in Bets. Uh, the second is How to Decide, and my latest is Quit the Power of Knowing When to Walk Away. Annie, welcome. You're absolutely incredible. Um, oh, I you. adore you and, uh, and everything that you've written here is absolutely fantastic. So congratulations and welcome and, and such an honor to, to have you on the, on the podcast. Uh, so yeah, bravo on being you. <laughs> oh, that was nice. That was a really nice, that, that makes me feel good. I, I was starting my day feeling good about myself. Thank you. Chris. Oh, fantastic. Where, whereabouts are you? Um, I'm outside of, um, I'm outside of Philadelphia. Fantastic. Where well, our politics is. As yeah. crazy as yours. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I mean, so we're recording this on Thursday, the 20th of October. Yeah, so I got, a, I got a text this morning saying, did Liz Truss read your book? Right. So <laughs> so an hour ago, our prime minister, another prime minister quit. Um, so what a fantastic uh, day to have a, a podcast chat about quitting um, yes. and knowing, knowing when to quit. She probably should have read your book and then maybe she would have quit a little bit sooner. Um, <laughs> I, I, can you quit sooner? <laughs> well, 40, it's a, I, we did look it up. It is a record. The only um, the only time a prime minister has had spent less time in in power was in the eighteen hundreds, and it was because the person died. Well, um, yes, so. there you go. Our <laughs> our so, shortest our our shortest running president also died. So right, yeah. he got sick on uh, inauguration day because it's very cold. Got pneumonia. Oh, died. Who was that? Oh gosh, I want to say. Was it William Henry Harrison? Now I feel like I have to look it up for now. <laughs> well, Google is your friend. <laughs> Harrison uh, died pneumonia. Let's see if that comes up. <laughs> William Henry Harrison. Whoa, you win all there the you points. Go. <laughs> there you go. So, you have to keep that in the podcast. That's pretty strong yeah, on my part. We Thank will you do. Very much. And this is another reason why if anyone's listening and they're doing auditions for a uh, pub quiz uh, contestants, get Annie on your team. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I will be I will be worse with British history. But if you need any American history, I'm very strong. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, well, look, I, I, I look forward to being on a pub quiz team with you sometime soon. Okay. Um, but we, we wanted to talk about your incredible book, um, which is behind me if you're watching this. Uh, quit the power of knowing when to walk away and I must just say when when I had this book I, I when I was sent the book very kindly to prepare for the podcast I had it on my desk and I actually covered it up with another book because I didn't want to walk into my office every day and see something saying quit and uh and it and it it's really interesting when you start reading it you realize <laughs> all these biases and all of these these behavioral traits that we have as humans that that, that make us so, like so sort of scared of, of, of even seeing the word. Um, and I just thought it's fascinating and brilliant. And yeah, I mean, I don't know whether you want to explain a little bit about it. Yeah. Like what, what brought you onto this? <laughs> so actually, it's so funny. So I had a conversation with David Epstein, who wrote uh, Range, which is right. a wonderful Lovely book. Way. I don't know if you've read it. Yeah, but it's, it it's amazing. Yeah. Oh, there, there, it's behind you. I actually think I still have it. It's still right there up on my bookshelf because we were videotaping <laughs> the, the, um, nice. the conversation. So I put it out for him. Uh, <laughs> and he asked me something very similar. And I, I will say it hadn't occurred to me beforehand. He said, so, and he held the book up. He said, just quit across the front. Like, uh, that was pretty bold because you know, who wants to buy a book called quit? Um, because it is, you know, we do have such negative connotations about it. Yeah. And it was the first time I thought, oh, maybe I should have named it something different for one second. But then I was like, no, that's the point. So Agreed. this is a situation where actually, so I'm not, I don't think I'm uh, particularly good at titling things. And with Thinking in Bats, uh, I pitched a completely different title, which let me tell you was terrible. And, um, <laughs> My editor is the one who actually was like, what do you think about calling it Thinking in Bets? And I was like, oh, okay, sounds good. Uh, and she also titled How to Decide. But with Quit, uh, from the moment that I thought of the book, I said, I want to write a book called Quit. 
I, I love it. Cause it's the opposite of grit. So what else should you call it? And, and my whole point is that, um, we have such a negative feeling. It evokes such negative emotions. Um, this idea of quitting or calling somebody a quitter. Like if I call you a quitter, I'm calling you a loser. Right. Yeah. Um, that I wanted to put it front and center on the front of the book, let people know that this is not just okay, but it's necessary. You have to quit a lot in order to have a good life, in order to achieve happiness, in order to be successful in any way that you define. So I now sit, now you've said it and, and David said it as well in the back of my mind. I'm like, because he says, I'm just imagining like being in an airport and seeing just quit sitting there and are people, you know, it's a little bit jarring, but I think that that was kind of the point because I'm really trying to rehabilitate the word. word so, uh, and, and I think, I think it's needed as well. Um, and what I thought was lovely, you mentioned uh, the, the grit book there and you're, I think, really good friends with the author. Is that right? Yeah. So, well, I mean, yeah, I know her and, and. <laughs> Somebody said to me, I mean, a few people have said to me, oh, I'd like to see you debate Angela Duckworth. Yeah. And I said, well, that would be silly because we'd agree. Yeah. Um, you know, because I think the problem is it's not that Angela didn't say anything brilliant. Her work is brilliant. People should buy that book. It's a really good book. Yeah, got it it's that <laughs> partly because of our bias toward persevering right. and our bias against quitting, people, right. I think misinterpret like they don't they don't see the nuance in what she's saying because she's not saying perseverance period is a virtue mm. what she's saying is you have to stick to things that are worthwhile even if they're hard mm. and that's a really important character trait like if a kid is playing a football game and they have a really bad day on the pitch you know and they walk off and they say you know i want to quit you know, it behooves us as parents to say, you just had a bad day yeah. and you need to sort of look at what the long run expectation is. And, you know, you have to sort of get through those ups and downs because you really love this game and you, sh you ought to keep playing at least for now. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's true for adults too. Like one bad day at the office shouldn't make you quit, yeah. but she would also agree that if your boss is toxic, you should quit. If yeah. uh, you get a concussion on the pitch, you should walk yeah. off the field. You shouldn't keep playing. Them being gritty yeah. is a bad idea. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of situations where we can, you know, where we can say that. So we're, we're agreeing. What I'm saying yeah. is stop saying that the only thing that's good is perseverance and somehow walking yeah. away from things is bad because both of them need to work together. Mm, I agree. And I, I thought it was lovely that you, you said in the book, there's, you know, there's no, there's no, no word in the dictionary for quittiness. Um, no, <laughs> but a, stick to right. things like grittiness. grittiness that's like that. a good thing, but nobody says, "Oh, I'm, I've got quittiness." You know, it's like the the words that we use shape us so much in our lives, um, and it, it it's so interesting. And when when I was reading it, the, one of the questions I don't know whether you looked into is, you know, often in life, uh, words in different languages have a different, a slightly different meaning or background. So I know that in English you know, quitting has a lot of negative, negative connotations to it. Did you find out in other languages, is that the same? Is it pretty universal? So I, I didn't look at other languages, but, but I do know that the biases that we're talking about are quite uh, strong. So mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what culture you're in these types of biases against quitting, and there are many, which I'm sure that we'll get into, are are quite universal. So I would expect that that would be reflected in the language also. Um, but I don't if, know. If, not, if you're listening to this, <laughs> email us and let us know. <laughs> let us know, right? Yeah. I mean, but if you, I mean, if you think about it, like, look, there there is no culture where people don't, for example, get sent into war. Um, and right. that's, that's really part of human history. And obviously you have to have a lot of grit in order to be able to do that. It behooves the, whoever the leadership is to be instilling grit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the people who are gritty and triumph are the heroes of the story. Even often the people who are gritty and don't triumph are the heroes mm -hmm. of the story. Um, they're just the heroes. And, and I don't think that that's particular to 
to us because you can look at um, uh, ancient texts, you know, and you can see, uh, see, see that kind of reflected in those texts as well. Yeah, it makes sense. And you, you start the book with this marvelous story um, about uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, the, the famous boxer. And you were showing me that the, the cover of your US edition of the book uh, even yes. has, has the boxing gloves on That's it. This um, just in case anybody's so watching. There you go. So if you're in, in the US, look out for that cover. <laughs> and um, I thought that was fascinating. I actually didn't, I, weirdly, I didn't know that story. Uh, I, I, I knew about the success that he had with Rumble in the Jungle, and then I, I didn't know any of the other stuff. But um, yeah, I don't know whether. Do you know why okay you didn't know any of the other story. stuff? Because I guess like re- he didn't win. <laughs> like, right. Well, because we we only hear the stories of the people who stick it out, and and particularly we really particularly love stories of the people who stick it out and overcome very long odds. Right. And what happens after that, we don't really remember. So. Yeah. Um, I think this is actually a really good example of why grit is good, but also why quit is good. So, because right. it's all kind of embodied in one human being. So, uh, Muhammad Ali, for those who aren't familiar with Born Cassius Clay, um, and he uh, won the heavyweight title against Sonny Liston um, uh, when he was still Cassius Clay. So, he was heavyweight champion of the world. Um, and then he converted. Uh, to Islam and became Muhammad Ali. Uh, and as part of that, he objected to the Vietnam War. So he refused to, to enlist um, and he was stripped of his heavyweight title. So that went on for a few years. Um, and then when they finally allowed him to get a license and to be able to fight again, um, took him four years to earn a title shot. Cause it wasn't like, Oh, you're Muhammad Ali. You were champion before. So now you're going to bypass yeah. the whole process. He still right. had to fight his way up in order to earn the title fight. So by the time he earned the title fight, he was already in his thirties. And mm. as you know, for a boxer that that's quite old. And the title fight was against a guy named George Foreman and George Foreman was formidable. I mean, first of all, he was huge. And second of all, his fights would kind of go like this. Uh, Someone would get in the ring with him. He'd punch them. They'd fall down and the fight would be over. And he was undefeated. So he was just really like a beast. And of course, you know, Muhammad Ali at that point is older. Now, when he was younger, the whole thing with him was uh, float like a butterfly, a sting like a bee, because he was so fast that you kind of couldn't touch him. Yeah. And then he would, you know, and then he would come in and get you. Um, But he's older now and he isn't that fast. So he comes in and he uses a different strategy, which is rope-a-dope, which is basically um, leaning against the ropes, allowing George Foreman to pummel him until George Foreman tired himself out. So that's what he does. This goes on for rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds. And he ends up winning the fight by time because George, I mean, it was actually an interesting strategy because George Foreman's fights like never went past a couple of rounds. So uh, endurance wasn't his strength. Yeah. So Muhammad Ali decided, I'm going to take the punches and I'm going to endure. He's going to tire himself out. And then that's how I'm going to win the fight. And it worked. So that was a rumble in the jungle. But what happens after that is actually really tragic. So mm. somewhat soon after that, um, his medical reports are coming back. Cause you know, now his new style is to take punches, right? So, uh, his medical reports start coming back and they're showing damage uh, in particular damage to his kidneys. um, And they're starting to worry about some neurological damage. So Teddy Brenner, who was the fight promoter at Madison square garden says to him, like, I really think that you need to hang up your gloves because um, he's concerned what, you know, in his words, what he says is I didn't, I didn't want to know if he came up to me and he didn't even know who I was one day because they were very good friends. I didn't want to know that I was part of that. Yeah. So he says to him, I think that you need to quit. So Muhammad Ali refuses and Teddy Brenner quits him. Says, I'm not going to host your fights anymore then. Cause he doesn't, he does not want to be part of this. Um, so then Ferdy Pacheco, who's Ali's fight doctor gets a, a very bad report on his kidneys. And he too goes to Ali and says, look, I really think you need to quit. Ali again refuses. And Ferdy Pacheco quits him. 
at which point he has a series of like really sad fights. Um, he starts, it's, it starts to become hard for him to get licensed. He does fight in um, Las Vegas. Well, he loses to Leon Sphinx on, it was like Leon Sphinx is like seven fight, seventh fight mm -hmm. in his whole life. But he also has a, a fight against Larry Holmes, which is so horrible. Holmes delivers him such a beating that Holmes cries after the match. This was a very famous incident that occurred because he was so upset because mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali was obviously like one of his heroes and it was just awful for him. So now he can't even get licensed in the U S which just so you know about boxing standards at that time is like impossible because yeah. <laughs> it's just like race to the bottom standards for each right. state to host fights. He ends up fighting in the Philippines and just a complete tragedy of a fight card where they've got one set of gloves to share among everybody and they're using a cowbell to signal the rounds. Um, and that was kind of it for him. And then, and then we know what happened after that, which was really bad physical decline. He ends up with mm -hmm. Parkinson's syndrome, you know, and obviously it's really severe neurological damage that affects the quality of his life for the rest of his life. And the, mm -hmm. here, that's the thing about grit. Like when everybody's telling, you no, it it's true that you might see something that other people don't see. And I think in the case of him really believing that he could be beat George Foreman, that was probably the case. Like he had a strategy. He felt like he had figured something out that other people couldn't see. Uh, and even though he was an underdog, he thought he could do it. And that's really the amazing thing about grit, right? Is it can get you to stick to that stuff and really yeah. try um, to get it done. The problem is though, that taken too far, like it does, sometimes you do see what the world doesn't see, but when the world mm. is screaming at you, and your friends are quitting you, like you got to pay attention to those signals. And at that point, grit becomes folly, right? It yeah. really becomes a vice. And that's the lesson is we think that grit is a virtue and quit is a vice, but um, the opposite of a great virtue is also a great virtue. And you need to balance out the two. Yeah, it's brilliant. And it's such a lovely story. I think in the in the book, which I found was lovely, is, um, bless you, you have... Um, Thanks. You use such a lovely wide variety of stories. Um, I know a lot of lot of people who listen to this podcast are not heavyweight champion boxers, no. um, but there's uh, <laughs> there's um, there's a lot of people who, who you know run startups or are doing their own their own ideas, and it, it was lovely to to hear the story as well. There was there was one about the um, the founding of of Slack. Um, which was, which was started from a computer game called Glitch, if I remember rightly. Yes. Um, well, the and, the game itself was called Game Never Ending, but the company was called Glitch. Yeah, the yeah. company is called Glitch. Sorry, yes. Thank you. And um, and then, uh, uh, but that, that was lovely because it, it it was it was a it's a it's a, sort of a beautiful story of he basically he quit the the company that they you know they raised. I think you were saying they had six million dollars left still in the bank. Um, and he woke up one morning and just goes, look, we're not going to do this anymore. And uh, I mean, that just boggled my mind, the bravery to be able to do that. Um, and and then the, so, and then the uh, amazing you know, I'm thing so, that came from it. I'm so glad you used the word bravery. So I want to dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So I think that we think about the people who persevere through really hard times as the brave ones. Mm. And in fact... You know, if you if you look up synonyms for like perseverance, grit, that kind of thing, you'll see words like bravery, heroism, um, because we think of those people as the heroes of the story. We think think, you know, when you when you think about someone gritting it out, you're thinking about somebody who's brave. Yeah. And when we think about quitters, we think about cowards and people who are right. weak willed. In fact, there's a very old world word called poltroon from the 1800s, which was a synonym for a quitter. And if you called somebody a poltroon back in the day, it was actually grounds for a duel. That oh, was wow. how bad an insult it was. <laughs> so very famously in, in the U S uh, Andrew Jackson um, uh, was called a, a poltroon in a paper. So it was a public right. publicly called a poltroon. He challenged the, the guy to a duel shot him dead and then became president of the United States. Wow. <laughs> like, because everybody was like, well, I mean, you know, he called you a poltroon. What could you do? Obviously you had to kill the guy, but you mentioned bravery. Right. And so why yeah. like, think about, so for Stuart Butterfield, so, so for people to understand this story, so he, he really has this dream of creating 
an online multiplayer, like massive multiplayer cooperative world building game. So he founds this company called Glitch. It was the second company he had founded. Um, and he developed this game called Game Never Ending. And he's got great backers. Andreessen Horowitz, Excel, those are two really big venture firms uh, in the US. And as you said, flush with cash. He's got $6 million in the bank. Um, and critics like freaking love this game. They love it. They're like, it's doc- Dr. Seuss meets Monty Python was the way that they described <laughs> it. It was like beautiful. Um, and he's actually got like 5,000 diehard users. And by 5,000 diehard users, I mean, they use the game. They're playing 20 hours or more a week. Okay. So those are the people who are obviously going to generate income for, for the game. The problem was that for every hundred people who came to the game, um, around 95 to 99 of them played for seven minutes and left. So they have Mm -hmm. a little bit of a problem, obviously with like customer acquisition, at this point, they've only been doing like PR and letting the critics, you know, who are reviewing the game, let people know about it. So they decide collectively that the investors and, and his co-founders to do a big marketing push. And uh, so for six weeks, they do paid marketing and they're really growing their users 6% week over week. Um, and this is in 2012. And then on the weekend of November 11th and 12th of that year, um, he, they have their biggest customer acquisition weekend ever. Uh, he goes to bed on uh, Sunday night, has a very restless night on Monday morning, wakes up and writes an email to his co-founders and his investors. I woke up this morning with the dead certainty that Glitch is, is dead. It's over. So um, what's going on? Because, you know, th- this is really weird because he ha- there's so many users uh, at this point. And um, obviously his co-founders believe in it. His investors believe in it. Mm-hmm. And they've got $6 million in the bank. And he explained it to him that if they were to continue to acquire users at the rate that they were, it would still be 31 weeks to break even. And that was a ridiculous assumption because when you're doing paid marketing, you start to saturate the market. Um, and that they just, it was just, you had to get too many people to come try it to get the ones who would stick. And it was never going to be a venture scale business. But as you point yeah. out, um, how is quitting their cowardice? That's bravery. Because he knew that, his investors weren't going to see it the way he saw it. He knew that his co-founders weren't going to see it the way they saw it. And in fact, they didn't. Um, They thought he was kind of nuts. And, and I asked him actually, like, did you ever convince them? And he said, well, I don't know. And I don't think it really mattered because if I didn't want to do it, they just sort of figured that was it. But he saw something. I mean, this is the thing, right? Muhammad Ali saw something other people didn't see that he could beat George Foreman. Stuart Butterfield now sees something that other people can't see, which is this business is not a business, at least not at the scale that they want it to be. And he he shuts it down when everybody thinks he's nuts and he knows everybody thinks he's nuts because he's doing it at a time when it's not so certain (laughs) that it's going to fail, that other people can surely see it. Yeah. You know, and he actually said that he he realized in retrospect that he should have shut it down six weeks earlier before they ever did the marketing push. But he was so afraid that people would think that he had just gotten bored with it or had like lost interest or was capricious that he Mm -hmm. himself wanted to accumulate a little bit more certainty before he actually, before he actually said no. Um, So that's an act of bravery, right? And not only do I think it's an act of bravery because you have to worry about what, what other people are going to say about you. It's an act of bravery because it's the moment you go from failing to having failed. That is the moment that you admit defeat, that you'd say, I can never make this work, that you're giving up the cause. That's really brave to walk away in that situation. It's also an act of bravery because you're wandering into the wilderness. Hmm. What's next? Am I going to find something else to do? If I quit my job, will I find another one? Will I like that? What if I break up with my relationship? Maybe I'm going to end up alone for the rest of my life. Those are all really, really scary things. So when you quit, it is an act of bravery. It is courageous. In some ways, I think more courageous than sticking to it. Because if you stick to it, you know everybody's going to clap and admire you. That's the, that's the thing about it, right? And I think that we really need to flip the script on that and realize that. So now as a coda, as you mentioned, two days later, he said, oh, we have this internal communication tool that people yeah. seem to really like. Um, maybe we should develop that. 
And that, of course, becomes Slack. Uh, he didn't even have a name at the time. He named it Searchable Log of All Company Knowledge. That, 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 that becomes <laughs> Slack. And we know that that works out really well. The temptation is that it's a it's a it's like a positive story about quitting because he mm. he developed Slack. But honestly, if he had never developed anything after that, it would still be a great story because he didn't you know waste his employees' time. He didn't waste his own time. He didn't waste his investors' money, and he did something incredibly mm. brave all on its own. It, it you mentioned something in um, a, a second ago that 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 stood out, and I, I remember I noted it down as something to talk to you about, and it was. Is this idea of uncertainty, you know, and that the humans naturally anything that's uncertain we we despise. Uh, you yes, know, I think, and, which is we, we do horrible because everything is uncertain. So right, and we we we, we, and we teach a lot of behavioral science courses with people like Rory Sutherland, and he, he an example he sometimes gives is uh, when you go when you're waiting for a train or waiting for a taxi, if you have no idea when it's going to come, uh, you, you get really angry. But if you know that it's coming in five ten minutes, it's fine. Yeah, um, yeah. and I think it's in in the book you you talk about it as you know the the if you if you quit something you have to be able to be happy with that uncertainty because you're not going to see it through so you don't know what the outcome will be and as as humans i think we we sometimes really struggle with that um yeah and and you you gave i mean you i think you you give lots of amazing examples in the book and i think there was one where you said uh, i think it was a friend of yours who's who was a doctor who who was was not sure whether to quit her job or take a new job and the job was all encompassing er emergency <laughs> doctor on call 24 hours a day not seeing her family um yeah i don't know whether it was worth yeah so okay so he, here's here's why quitting is such an incredibly valuable skill to develop being good at exercising that option right as you said like whenever we make any decision almost any decision uh, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty. We're making those decisions under conditions of uncertainty. One is just luck can just yeah. influence the outcome in a way that, that we can't predict very well. Um, but also there's hidden information, right? So we know very little in comparison to all there is to be known generally when we make decisions. And what that means is that after we start something, uh, we're going to learn new stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So Chris, I'm sure you've had that feeling. I wish I knew then what I know now. Um <laughs> hundred percent. Right. Yeah. So that's that feeling of, well, when I made the decision, I, w I, you know, I didn't know what I needed to know. And, um, now I learned new things and man, if I had known that then maybe I would have made a different choice. So, uh, so here's where quitting becomes so valuable because you can make a different choice yeah. even after you've started it. So when you learn the new information, you can switch like for Stuart Butterfield, right? It's like when he creates this beautiful game, that his prediction is people are going to love, you know, and everybody's going to be really into it. And then it turns out that people aren't as into it as he thought he can quit. Okay. Yeah. So that's the greatness of having that option. Imagine if you had to marry the first person you ever dated, <laughs> that would be rough. Imagine if the first job you took out of like, you know, university you had to stick with, you weren't allowed to switch careers or jobs or, you know, I mean, this would be really hard for us as decision mm. makers. But lucky for us, we, we, we have this option to change our mind for most things. Um, <laughs> the problem is that the very uncertainty that we feel when we're entering a decision, we also, it also influences when we exit. Yep. But it's asymmetric the way that that uncertainty bothers us. Okay. So as you said, we kind of want to know how the story ends. And the story in this case is what you've already started. Because that feeling of what if is really hard for us. Like if we switch and then we're like, what if I had stayed? What if I had married my college sweetheart? What if I hadn't quit my job? What if I, you know, I know there was a huge snowstorm on the top of Everest, but what if I had kept going? Maybe I would have turned it around. Or like in the case of Stuart Butterfield, like, well, I had 6 million in the bank. What if I kept going? Maybe all yeah. of a sudden the game would have caught on, right? These are really hard things for us to live with. And the only way for us to know for sure is to stick with what we're doing. And what that means is that <clears throat> unlike Stuart Butterfield, who is definitely the exception here, we'll usually keep going with things until it's a right. dead certainty that it can't work. Right. Because when you think about like, but if other people are going to think that I'm weak willed, well, but not if I say, but I yeah. fell into a crevasse, obviously I couldn't keep climbing, you know, or, um, 
I used all my vacation days uh, and all of my sick days. And I was missing work because my boss was so toxic. I couldn't take it anymore. Then people are like, oh, sure. Of course you should have quit. Right. Yeah. Or if you if, like, you see this with sports athletes all the time, right? Like uh, when a footballer has that last season where they're just terrible, everybody agrees at that point that they should quit. But when someone quits at the top of the game, we're all like, eh. right. Yeah. So, so we can sort of feel that is that, uh, you know, Richard Thaler, who, who, is a Nobel laureate. So I really like to quote things that Nobel laureates said, um, <laughs> said, usually the only time we're willing to quit is when it's no longer a choice. Mm. Meaning I that we, we've see, already butted up against the dead certainty that there's nothing probably else. Probably see that, that a lot do. in relationships, I'd imagine. Right. Exactly. Like there's literally, it's just like, there is no other way. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So Sarah Olson Martinez was someone who actually reached out to me uh, through my website. And so, and by the way, people can do that. You can go to annieduke.com and, and write me. I try wow. to respond to everyone. I am nowhere near perfect, but I do make an attempt. Um, but so she wrote me and she said, oh, that she was having trouble with a decision about whether to quit her job. I happened to be in the middle of writing a book called Quit. And so I was like, hey, do you want to get on a Zoom? Yeah. So I did. And um, so she was somebody who had been in the ER doc and that had been her training. And uh she then got promoted to be a hospital administrator. And the thing about being an ER doc is it's like typical shift work, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as soon as you're done with the shift, you go home and that's it. Your work does not come home with you. But when you're uh, an administrator, that's not the case and your work follows you home. Um, and her love was really actually being in the ER. Um, and she had uh, she was down to about six shifts a month in the ER and the rest of her time was spent with administration and she was miserable. And the way she described it to me, like she had two small children, um, that it was just constant emails and her phone dinging at her. She wasn't able to spend any time. Like her kids were saying, like, you just ignore me. Like all you do is look at your phone. Um, and so that was like really unhappy for her. Plus she wasn't doing the thing that she loved in the first place. And also like the environment had changed because it was during the pandemic. Uh, you know, reimbursements had changed, things like that. Like our, the healthcare system and reimbursements and things like that in America is not the best. Um, so, uh, so it was just, it was, she just wasn't like, she was, she was incredibly unhappy and mm -hmm. she had been unhappy for years. So this gets us a little bit to that, like butting up against certainty, right. Before you're willing to actually walk away. So I was a little confused that she had a question about whether she should quit, particularly because she had another job lined up, which does take away some of that uncertainty that we're afraid of. So I said to her, so why aren't you quitting? Cause I was confused and she kind of said two things that I think are really important. One is I've put, well, she said three things. The first was I've put so much time, like I've done all this training. I have so much of me like in this mm -hmm. job. Uh, and that I think is very common when you hear people like, why haven't you left the relationship? I put so much time into it. Like, I don't want to have waste what I've already put into it. You're okay. But that's already life, gone. Right? And the question is, are you going to keep wasting your time going forward? But that's a very strong feeling that we get. That's a mm. pretty typical sort of sunk cost fallacy kind of problem. Mm. The second thing she said is the other e doc, our docs are going to think that I'm a wuss. And the people who believed in me, who promoted to me to be administrator are going to be mad at me. Okay, so this gets a little into the Stuart Butterfield territory of he says he waited six weeks longer than he really should have mm. because he was he thought that people were going to think it was bored or capricious or yeah. you know just like lost interest for no reason and he's sort of trying to defend against those negative feelings that he thinks that people are going to have and so is she she's saying they're going to you know the, i mean the thing about you know er docs are a little bit like navy seals over here right like the a lot yeah. of their you know, ethos is, is grit. That's where they get yeah. a lot of their identity from. And she was worried they were going to think she, she, she had given up. Right. And that she yeah. was, she had abandoned them. So that was also a big problem. But then this was the really telling one. I said, okay, well, what else? And she said, well, what if I take the new job and I don't like that one either? So I was like, okay, <laughs> I kind of see the problem here. So I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Imagine it's a year from now and you stay in your current job what's the probability that you're going to be happy? She said 0%. Okay. So here we are, right? We're here. We are, we're, we're in the crevasse already. So that's kind of the point, right? She'd been thinking about it for a long time, but before she actually got to sort of this point where she was maybe going to pull the trigger, um, 
it's a hundred percent that she's going to be unhappy in a year. Yeah. So that's what Richard Thaler is saying. It's no longer a choice because you already, it's like, it's already a dead certainty at this point. Right. Yeah. So I was like, okay, so let's say you take this new job. What are the chances in a year that you'll be happy? And she said, well, I don't know. Like I haven't been taking the job. I mean, I've done, I don't know. And I was like, well, just take a guess. I guess 50, 50. Well, it's 50% greater than zero. Hmm. And I, you know, her face was, she was just like, Oh, you know, it, it took that. And then she, then she saw it right. Then she saw it. She quit. She took the new job. Last I checked, she was really happy because awesome. we checked back in with each other. But this is where we see this need for certainty is asymmetric. Hmm that what we want to be certain about is the thing we're already doing, right? So uh, we need to know that we have no hope. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is that we're willing to tolerate really bad situations because we're uncertain about whether the other thing is going to work out. Right. So when we think about like anticipating the regret we might feel about a choice, the regret we'll feel is about the thing we switch to if that doesn't work out mm. much more so than, than, you know, sort of the level of tolerance that we have for being in a miserable situation once we've already started it. Mm. it it's so powerful. I mean, I guess it's those, you know, well, firstly, well done and bravo for helping that lovely lady. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, it's always nice to help people. And um, See, I mean, th I this is, there's a lesson in that. If you write to me, cross your fingers, that uh, that it's a topic that I happen to be writing a book about because yeah. then I'll get on the Zoom with you. And you, you were saying earlier that Liz Truss wrote to you um, just last night. <laughs> yes, um, just last night. <laughs> yeah. and, and I said, well, listen, I've got a book for you. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we, well, we've been fascinated over here in America watching. It, well, it's a lovely experiment. You, you don't need uh, you don't need a, a soap opera or a, a, anything like that anymore. You can just turn on the, the, the UK news. Right. Um, <laughs> um, the the thing which I was going to ask you, which I guess is related, is you know what what would be some of your advice to people? What what kind of things can they ask themselves or look out for to know when they perhaps should be quitting or at least thinking about it? Um, yeah. So okay. So let me just say this first of all. Usually, usually by the time you quit, it's it's already way later than you should have. So right. if you quit at the right time, it's going to feel like it's too early. Right. Um, so I, I think that you can see that with Stuart Butterfield, right? Like he even yeah. feels he quit too late, but everybody felt like it was too early. So he's really unusual right. in that. Um, so this is, I think this is something really key is that at the point that you experience it as a close call, yeah. think about Sarah Olsen Martinez. She thought she had a close call, but I think that you can tell that this was not close. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But she experienced it as a close call. And Steve at Levitt, who, yeah. who wrote the book Freakonomics, actually did a super fun thing. He put up a website where people could go and be like, should I quit my job or, or should I stay? Should I stay in my relationship oh, or not? It's a coin flip, right? Yeah. And yeah. he invited people to flip a coin to decide for them. So let's agree that if, if you're willing to flip a coin, which is obviously by definition 50-50, that you must think that the, the choice itself is 50-50. Um, right. meaning, and so let's translate that into what that means. And it's the way that I translated it for Sarah was, uh, you think that it's equally likely you'll be happy if you stay than if you go, which mm -hmm. is why I put it into happiness terms for her. Um, so he asked, said, so, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how happy you are, they rated it, um, and then flip the coin and it's like, you should quit your job or you should stay in your job. Uh, and so they would go and do that. He would check in with everybody two and six months later and again, ask them, how happy are you now? And what he found was that it wasn't 50-50 at all, that the quitters were happier. Mm. So the first thing to understand is if you're thinking about quitting, it's actually quite likely that you're already a little late to the decision. <laughs> all right. So that's great advice. Right. So that's like just advice. Number one is just realize that. And, you know, there's a management heuristic anyway, like the first time you think about firing it, somebody is the moment that you should fire them. Yeah. Uh, nobody does that though. So, okay. <laughs> but let's now let's take into account, like, uh, just sort of what the human condition is, right. That that's really hard to do. 
because we do have these problems of the first time we think about quitting, we're wondering, like, did I just have a bad day? Um, you know, maybe I'm just not, I need to tough it out, like that kind of stuff. So, so we want to sort of take that into account so that you can feel at peace with your yeah. quitting. So the first time you think about quitting, uh, there are two things you should do. The first is to set kill criteria for yourself. So kill criteria is some combination of a state and a date. So the date would be, I'm in this situation. Let's say it's a job that you hate, let's say. Um, how long do I feel like I can tolerate this situation for? So this that's going to be the date. So you're setting mm -hmm. a deadline for yourself. Um, so let's say you say, I can deal with this for two more months. All right, so that's your date. Um, so now the question is, what's the state? So say to yourself, okay, imagine it's two months from now. What are the signals I might be seeing? What are the things that might be occurring that would tell me that I should walk away, that things have not gotten better and I'm still miserable? So you write down what those things are. And then you can also set benchmarks, like what are the things that would tell me that things are better? Okay, so you, you literally write that stuff down. And then you can take the step of saying what, what would be the inputs to that? Like maybe I should have a conversation with my boss, All right? So, you know, you're, you're trying to get to, you're not, you're not a passive person in, right. in this. Okay, you set that down. And then in two months, if you're seeing those signals that you should walk away, then you should quit. If you're seeing the things that things have turned around, that's great. And you should set new kill criteria. Okay, right. right. So in three months, I'm going to see if this situation is persisting. Um, the reason why that's really helpful is this. We have the intuition that when we see those signals, we're going to react rationally to them. But we know that that's not true. Right. We know that from Muhammad Ali, for one thing. We know that from all the, the people who have perished on the top of Everest. Yeah. We know that from our friends because we yeah. see our friends in relationships that we know they should walk away from or jobs we know or they should walk away from or projects that should have been shut down a long time ago. And we can see that even though the signals are quite obvious that they're not actually paying attention to them. And then I'm sure, Chris, you've been in this situation. Someone comes and complains to you. Let's say it's like a relationship or a job. They tell you, oh, I'm so happy, blah, blah, blah. I'm really thinking that maybe I'm going to walk away. And then you see them three months later and they and they say, oh, I'm really unhappy. I'm yeah. really thinking I should walk away. And then you see them three months later. And like literally at some point you're like, you're not allowed to have this conversation with me anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because they're relying on themselves to react rationally in the moment. So mm -hmm. instead of saying when I'm in it, like when I'm having to face the decision down, I'm going to rely on myself to actually pay attention to those signals and walk away. Instead, say in advance, when you're not in it, what are those signals? And I'm going to make a pre-commitment to walk away when, when I see those. That will actually really improve your quitting decision. It will also make you more comfortable with the decision. This is both from the standpoint of someone who might be quitting. Or, for example, an employer, when an employer fires somebody, they're quitting the employment relationship. It's a form of quitting. Um, and yeah. it, it it makes it more comfortable for an employer as well, it makes it easier for the employee because you're sort of coming together and understanding what the expectations are uh, that will cause you to walk away. So that's the, the first thing to do. And that's called kill criteria. Very powerful tool. And the mm -hmm. second thing is get someone to help you. <laughs> so instead of just going like instead of me just going and complaining to Chris, what I ought to do instead is say, Chris. I, I think I'm really unhappy. Uh, you're someone who I feel like you have my best interest at heart. I don't want you to tell me what I want to hear or you think I want to hear, which mm -hmm. is for you to cheerlead me. Like when I say, I know I can turn around for you to say, I know you can, you know, which is what we want to do, right? Like we don't want to hurt yeah. anybody's feelings. And instead for me to say to you, I'm giving you permission, Chris, to tell me what you actually see and mm -hmm. to help me with this decision. Right. So now you can say, well, it does seem like things aren't going well. Um, do you want to set some kill criteria? And yeah. now we've created a partnership where you're going to hold me accountable to those things. So when we revisit for whatever the deadline is that we've set, we can actually look and sort through like and you can remind me, like you said, if mm -hmm. this was still happening, that you were going to actually quit. Uh, and that's going to help me get to that decision a lot more quickly as well. So those are really like the two best strategies for when that thought crosses your mind, set a deadline, make it a relatively short timeline, really lay out what are those benchmarks and get someone to help you with the decision. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of the, sort of the greatest mentors I've I've ever been lucky enough to have kind of have, have given me that permission. They've, they've gone, okay, well, <laughs> let's set a criteria and a deadline and talk about this in, in a week's time. And 
if you're still feeling this way, then you know what you've got to do. Um, right. And this is something good for parents too, right? Like, I mean, yeah. as parents, we obviously want to instill grit in our kids, right? So, uh, you know, and we have the problem as parents of saying, you know, is my kid just, you know, just upset because they had a bad day, right? Mm -hmm. Or is this something that really is making them unhappy? And if I'm thinking about something that I'd like them to do, I ought to switch them to something else. So, you know, an example would be, and I think that this is a problem that we get into is that whatever the thing that we choose to do as an expression of the actual goal that we have, the thing we choose to do becomes the object. So an example of that would be like, we'd all like our, our children to finish school, right? Um, so uh, we'd like them to get all the way through sixth form. Uh, do you know why I know that? Because I went to a school in, in the US where we had forms. <laughs> Okay. So, nice. well so I got all the way, I did, I graduated after sixth form <laughs> myself. Um, so, uh, so, so we'd like, we'd like that to happen. Right. So now you're sort of going around and you're choosing schools right. and the school that you choose is actually a method to, to help your child achieve the goal of finishing school in general, not necessarily that school. But yeah. then what happens when your child is unhappy at that school is you have this tendency to want to help them to push through it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, where we think like, well, no, you have to persevere. I have to help you develop this grip muscle. And you're, you're telling them they have to stay in that school. But why? Mm -hmm. As long as they're switching to a different school, it's not like they're not being great. They're still going to achieve their goal. That would be true also, like if you want them to play sports, right? And they try football and for whatever reason, they're like super uncoordinated or whatever, you know, yeah. and it would be better if they were a swimmer, but you're making them continue because now football has become the object as opposed to the actual object, which was, I want them to do a sport. Okay, so mm -hmm. for parents, now how can we do this? We can also apply this for ourselves. If our child comes home and they're really miserable at school, you say, okay, like maybe it's toward the end of the term or something. You say, let's see how it goes, you know, toward the end of the term. What is it that's making you unhappy? Maybe they're being bullied or something like that. Um, and you say, okay, let's see if you're, you know, if that's still persisting. I'm going to go talk to the school administrators. Maybe I'm going to talk to the parents of the person who's bullying you. Um, try to figure that out, but then let's list out what would tell us that things were better, what would tell us that things yeah. are worse, and then understand it doesn't mean that you get to quit full stop. It means that we're going to start going on a search for another school because I'm sorry, bud, but you got to finish school, yeah. right? And same thing, like you had a bad day at football or you feel like you're uncoordinated. There's five more games in the season. Let's look at how you're feeling at the end of those five games. And then if, if you're not meeting the criteria that would tell us that you should continue, if you're, if you're meeting the criteria that tell us you should quit, then we have to figure out another sport for you and take the learnings from what it was that you hated about football. Right. And, and figure out what the right sport for you to try is. Cause I'm sorry, you're going to have to stick with physical activity. Yeah. Right. It's, it, it's fascinating as well. And I don't know whether it's the same in your life, but I'm, as you were talking, I was trying to think back and, you know, at all the times when I've, when I've had those conversations with people where they've come up and said, oh, you know, I'm really unhappy with something and I, you know, I want to quit something. And then, and then eventually, you know, hopefully they do make the decision and do quit. But it's always um, like, you know, two years later after yeah, you're like, stop having this conversation right. with yeah. me. <laughs> but, um, um, uh, I can't think of any examples where it didn't end up better i mean i'm sure that there are a few but i think by and by i would imagine if you looked at you know if there was a problem and you changed uh, i would imagine statistically yeah. you're much more likely to to be in a happier healthier place because i think psychologically i would imagine we we also up to a point make it so that we're happy with our choice like once you've so i think i think that's true you know i also think that we're much more afraid like loss aversion Right. It's just the thing, right? That when we're thinking about starting something, uh, we're very focused on the losses, the potential losses, mm. the probability that we might lose at it. Now, obviously, there are losses, potential losses associated with the path we're already on, very often quite mm. certain ones, like in the case of Sarah Alston Martinez. But loss aversion is asymmetric in that way. Loss aversion prevents us from starting things. So if yeah. we've already started something and we're already on that path, loss aversion doesn't recruited, get recruited in the same way. Because when you quit something, it's usually to start something new. And so we get right. very focused on the losses associated with the starting something new. 
But I think that it, um, in reality, the reason why when you look back and you say, can I think of any example where someone was unhappier? And the answer is no, it's actually a little recursive in nature for the reason that it's because we won't quit until it's basically a near certainty that you would right. have to be happier, right? right? That That's the thing. Yeah. And that's way after we should have quit in the yeah. first place. So Sarah Olson Martinez was incredibly unhappy for like three years <laughs> before she yeah. got to that decision to actually walk away. So how could it be that she wouldn't be happier? Like not just on average, but like it's got to be greater than 0%, right? So, yeah. you know, I think that in order to help us with that problem, we need to start really imagining the alternative. So one of the things I do with like executives that I coach where they're really worried about firing someone. So let's say that they're, you know, a startup and in, in growth, a uh, growth period phase. And um, they're just worried about having that role empty. Yeah. Having no one in that role. And what I'll say to them is, so, so, you know, they'll go, wow, but what happens? But then we'll have nobody in the role. And I just rephrase it and say, okay, well, what's worse? having this person in the role or nobody. And we actually walk through that, right? Because I say this person is creating problems on the team. I think that the people on their team are now flight risk. Because this person is not doing their job, they may be quiet quit, <laughs> which yeah. really I hate that term because it's not quitting. It's staying in your job <laughs> and just not doing it. Right. Um, you know, and, and so they're creating like a somewhat toxic environment. And let's remember that when they're in that role, they're a blocker. Because naturally, when people leave a role, the other people, knowing that it's temporary, will come in and pick up that slack, but they can't do it when someone is yeah. sitting there and then they're just pissed because the job is not getting done, right? So we kind of walk through that and then they have this realization like, no, nobody in the role is actually better than this person in the role and it helps them to get to that decision. And it's the true with like a relationship, right? Where they're like, well, what if I'm alone? It's like, well, what if? Like, are you happy now? No. Okay. So do you think there that probably and assuming alone is temporary, don't you think that there's a better chance that you can find happiness being alone? And when you phrase it that way, they go, Oh wait, yeah, I'm actually at this point I think I would be happier alone. Yeah. So you have to sort of focus them over on what what are they losing to the decision to stick. And and this gets to something I think that is so important for people to understand is that we think that quitting is going to stop our progress, but it actually speeds us up. It speeds us up when quitting is right, because when we're stuck in a dead end job or a bad relationship, is that helping us to gain ground toward what our ultimate goal is, which I assume is mm. happiness and fulfillment and a good life? No, of course not. It's causing us to lose ground. So then you would want to switch because whatever path you're on is going to have a higher probability of getting you to actually achieve your goals in the same way that if you're on a road and a truck is overturned on the, on the road and traffic is not moving, you ought to exit right away in order to get to where you want to go faster. That's also true of quitting. If you're on a path that isn't going well, you should quit to some, you know, and switch to something that's actually going to be better. And this is, this is why I say quitting is so necessary for success. And one of yeah. the things that I think is so important for people to really internalize is this phrase, life's too short. So when you're sitting in that miserable relationship and you're afraid of all the things that come with walking away from it, right? The time, yeah. oh, I've wasted my time and I put so much time into this thing. And what if I'm alone? And what if I go to a new relationship and that doesn't work out? Even though the one you're in, it's a dead certainty. You've tried couples counseling been together for a long time. It's been bad for a long time. What you have to say to yourself is my life's too short because the forces that are keeping me in it, do I want to waste another year of my life? Do, if I'm unhappy at 35, do I want to wake up at 45 and have had 10 more miserable years? Or do I want to switch? Because my life is really short. Yeah. And it we owe it to all of ourselves to be brave and to walk away from the things that aren't working so that we can go do things that are. It's amazing. It's so powerful. <laughs> I've got so many other questions, but I know that we're already running out of time. So um, It's okay. I have I'll, a little extra if you want. Okay. It's okay. I've got I'll time be, yeah, I'll, be very, I'll be very quick. It's all, no, so, it's all good. Um, 
the 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 thing which we won't talk about which is one reason just one more reason why you need to go and read the book is that you also particularly around work you say that there are a few companies that actually actively encourage quitting and you give this lovely story about astro teller and google x which yes I, it's fantastic so don't tell the story but instead anyone who's listening go read the book it's really good um and then you'll also learn about monkeys and pedestals and getting monkeys yes yeah, so go anyway. go yeah because monkeys and pedestals is super, super fun you'll also learn about forced quitting which I yeah. think is great. And the, and and the part of the book that I really love that people should go check out is that goals are not necessarily good. Yes. Which I is very that. counterintuitive, but goals yeah. can goals can really mess you up. Yeah, and no, it, it, it's I instinctively have a real, real issue love hate relationship with goals like because I feel like they're too static and life changes and moves and and i think you kind of allude to that in the book it's like well i mean that it's it's the it's the school problem right Right. if you if you have a goal a broad goal for somebody to finish school then what happens is that you figure out like what's the way that i want to achieve this and now you put them in a school and it becomes about finishing that school right 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 and so then what happens is that you keep going toward the finish line come what may so um So my favorite example of that actually comes from the 2019 London Marathon, a woman named Siobhan O'Keefe, who was running the marathon in a mile eight, she broke her leg, her fibula bone snapped. Um, So one would assume that she would stop running, but she did not. Um, And she actually finished the race, as did, by the way, three other people who broke stuff in that same marathon. I mean, because this happens in every single marathon. And so the question is like, why? And the answer is because there was a finish line. So the problem we have is that while eight miles is certainly like a, a, a triumph in the, in the context of a 5K, you've actually run more, mm. right? Yeah. It's a failure in the context of a marathon because you set that finish line. And what happens when we set finish lines is that we don't measure our progress, like the eight miles that we ran. We're thinking right. about the 18.2 miles that we haven't run. And if you quit the race, you're going to have to take that loss. In other words, the loss being how, how short you are of whatever the final goal is. And so that is why she keeps running. Um, and that's true of any goal, whether it's like a project that you're trying to complete or a product that you're trying to develop, or you, ha- you know, you have your child in school, you've started them in football or for yourself, anything like that. It's very hard for us to walk away when we haven't actually achieved the goal, even when the facts on the ground have changed. She broke her leg. Yeah. You know, uh, the world is telling you you're over budget and you've blown your timelines and it's, you're not, you know, your customers don't even want the product, but yet just keep going until you have no choice but to quit or you've reached the goal. Yeah. And that's really bad. But here's the thing that I want to say, because I want to go back to this bravery thing. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say this is true for me, but I want to ask you, when you hear this story about Siobhan O'Keefe, finishing that marathon on a broken leg. Is there a part of you that's like, wow, that's really badass. Um, I don't know. I think it's nuts. Um, I don't know but like kind of badass, right? It, no, I mean, look, it's, it's, yeah, it's a fine line between bravery and stupidity, I think. Well, well that's true. <laughs> that's true. But, you know, I think, I think that, I think that, um, I know for me, there's a small part of me that's like, oh man, oh yeah no i I agree like i I wish i was that cool yeah amazing (laughs) right but we shouldn't think that as you said because she's sacrificing possibly you know this is a problem of opportunity costs right like uh she's sacrificing maybe ever being able to run a marathon again because that's a good way to get a compound fracture um Mm. so you know when the medical tent it's like muhammad ali when the medical tent is like no stop running you really have to stop you're going to do permanent damage uh, and, and you may end up with permanent injury, like mm-hmm. you ought to walk away. And yet, uh, when she keeps running the, the, the newspaper stories are like all very positive. They're like, mm-hmm. Oh, and she kept running and that's so cool. <laughs> and she's so awesome. And I think this is where we get into quitting as an act of bravery, right. because the thing is like, in a lot of ways, persevering is the easy choice. Like I understand it's physically hard, mm-hmm. but from a cognitive standpoint, it's an easy choice. Cause you know, that someone's going to write some amazing article about what a badass you are, which is exactly <laughs> what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, with, with you, um, I mean, what, what, what's the sort of, 
what's the hardest thing that you've had to quit in in your own life or, or... well I, so i would say um your bravest moment <laughs> yeah So, I mean, I kind of have two answers to this. I mean, poker was really hard for me to quit. It was very much part of my identity. You know, I mean, it's it's particularly hard when it's not just like your career, but like you're on television, like it's your brand. Right. It, it so becomes who you are that when you walk away, you know, and I was walking away because I, I you know, I, I really wanted to write these books. And there's yeah. all that like, well, what if the books flop? Like, what if nobody reads them? What if somebody doesn't want to read a, a book on cognitive mm -hmm. psychology for, from somebody that they think is a poker player, even though I'm a cognitive <laughs> psychologist, but people don't know me as that, yeah. right? Um, and when I walked away, I really didn't ever play again. So right. um, so I think that, that that was really hard and I probably should have done it earlier because I was unhappy for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was really hard. So I would say maybe that was the hardest thing I had to quit, but but where my mind actually goes is um, in a different direction, which is, so I quit graduate school five years in uh, what we call ABD, meaning my dissertation was done. I just hadn't mm -hmm. like defended it. And the reason that right. I quit was because I got sick. Uh, I ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. So this is, you know, it's sort of forced quitting. And during, mm -hmm. when I was, when I was sick, I, I then needed to take a year off. So I, I was going out for all my job talks and I had to cancel them. Um, and so now during that year, I just needed money. And that's when I started playing poker. So mm -hmm. I started playing poker, loved it, obviously kept doing it for 18 years. And, uh, you know, at that time, this was before, like, we had cell phones and texting people. Mm -hmm. And it was harder to keep in touch with people. And I kind of lost touch with uh, my mentors from graduate school. Right. And I carried around with me for 18 years a tremendous amount of shame over quitting there, mainly because I just felt like I had let them down. So, mm -hmm. you know, mentors put a lot of time into you in graduate school. And I felt all of those things that are those negative emotions about quitting, you know, even though I, mm -hmm. I had found something that I was really good at that I really enjoyed, I felt like, I, you know, I'd let these people down, that, um, mm -hmm. that they were probably very ashamed of me. Um, uh, and I really like, I mean, this was something, I mean, I, th I, this was something I thought about a lot. So at completely accidentally in 2012, this was after I, I had left poker, I ran into Lila Gleitman, who was my advisor at Penn right. in a doctor's office. And there she was. And I got up the nerve and I went over and said, hello. And, uh, she was in her early eighties at this point and her face just lit up. I mean, it was, it was really quite something. Mm. And, um, from that moment on, we saw each other every single week because we lived in the same area at that point. Uh, we saw each other every single week and I got a whole decade of total and utter joy with her before she passed, um, in her early nineties. And, um, I think that, What's so important about this is, is again, sort of same thing that happened with Sarah Olson Martinez. When she left, you remember I said she, she thought that everybody was going to be very disappointed in her. Right. And when I asked her about it, she said, no, actually, they all were very happy that I was leaving. They understood. Um, and in some ways, they felt they had failed me, that they hadn't helped me to achieve better work-life balance that would have allowed me to be happier in my job. And I had a, a very direct conversation with Lila about the shame that I had felt um, over leaving and she was just like, what? No, like we were so proud of you. We were sad that we lost touch, but our job as mentors isn't for you to do what we do. It's mm -hmm. for you to go find something that you find joy and happiness in. Mm -hmm. And she just made it very clear that she had never felt anything but love for me through all of that. So I think this is something that's really important to re realize when you're with these quitting decisions is that the stories that we tell in our heads are very different than then, you know, how people do actually view mm -hmm. us and, and think about, you know, these choices that we make. Um, you know, and obviously there are some mentors who would be mad. There are leaders who get pissed off if you shut a project down, but they're not very good ones. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the good ones are going to love you through all of it. And that, that's the thing that you have to remember. Well, I'd, I'd imagine any mentor you have would be very proud of you. I think you've 
oh, done oh, remarkable crazy. things and your your book is is well, your books are amazing and your and your new one is absolutely marvelous as well and i think you're going to help many thousands of people uh understand how to live their lives a little bit better so thank you uh and, well, uh, thank and you. on being you and, and being so marvelous so I'll, I'll uh I, there were two things i was going to end on one was okay. i I loved this marvelous quote that you said from uh, uh, Danny Kahneman. Um, you said you like quoting Nobel laureates. I do. Yes. Uh, and uh, I, I thought it was lovely advice. You said, was it, um, whatever you said to Danny, I think, w- what would you suggest uh, people need if they want to be able to better understand or make a better decision when it comes to quitting? And he said, what everybody needs is the friend who really loves them um, but does not care much about their hurt feelings in the moment, <laughs> which I thought yeah. was uh, was so lovely and what a, what a marvelous piece of advice. Um, and I think you you you've sort of alluded to that a, a yeah. lot in, in in this chat that we've had. So um, yeah, you, you you obviously listen to the wise man as well. Um, I try, I try. <laughs> it's such a wonderful book, and and you again just for people who haven't read this yet, the everything in the book is referenced. I mean. There's sort of a, almost a, a, a sixth or something of the book is is taken up with with references. It's really, really, really well. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, Absolutely it's incredible. you know this this there this is um the thing that I'm I that, that's incredibly important to me as as a writer is that uh, what I'm saying is evidence based. I mean, mm. my training is in cognitive mm. science, obviously, and uh, if it isn't a study that's been replicated where you can believe in the results of the study. I don't want to say it. So, uh, mm. whatever I'm, you know, uh, there's a lot of like Richard Thaler's work, Colin Cameron's work, Barry Staw is another person who's really done work in this topic of escalation of commitment, the way that we really, really double down on, on losing mm. causes. Uh, obviously Dan, Danny Kahneman, um, Jack Netch, uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, if people are really interested in the science of quitting uh, and what really gets in our way in terms of uh, the deep work on cognitive bias that's been done, uh, that that is, you you can definitely get that out of this book. Okay, well, this and then t- two very fun random questions just to finish okay. the podcast. With. Would you rather say, so would you rather have the ability to send to see ten minutes into the future or a hundred and fifty years into the future? That's an interesting question. 10 minutes into the future would be more useful for me personally. Um, uh, no more surprises though. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Um, but I think that, I think that, uh, that is true, but that there wouldn't be surprises, but I'm actually super obsessed with like the long view. So for me personally, right. uh, just, just for my own curiosity, I would take yeah. the, the 150 years. Ah, oh, okay. All right. As was, and then the other one I kind of made up on the spot, but I, it would be something like, uh, would you rather have to quit everything that you start after a year or <laughs> see everything through that you continue to do after a year? Well, you know, the problem with this, the, the thing is that I would totally say yes, no... except for the problem of my husband. <laughs> well, you could, because I was trying to think about it as a, if you see something through for over a year, then you probably want to stay with it. Like within a year, that's a good time. You would have had a decision. You'd have, you would have had that. Yeah, but I would be fine, except except for my husband and my children. I would be <laughs> fine with quitting. Literally, I would be fine with quitting everything after yeah. a year. I really would. So I love quit, exploring. Well, apart from family. <laughs> apart from family. I would take quitting right. because the thing about it is that that gives you an opportunity to explore new things. And, and then you explore these new things and you actually really like them. Right. Yeah. And also we'd have to talk about the level. Like I'm not going to quit exercise, but like maybe I'm quitting yoga yeah. after a year and yeah. going and finding something else to do. I actually think that that would be super fun. Yeah. So I would That'd totally take fun. that as long as it's not like family. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, look, thank you so, so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. This has been one of my favorite conversations of all time. I hope we get to meet and 
chat again and and yeah thank you so so much really really well thank you i hope so too yeah wish you all the very best for your book and if anyone's listening uh best place to go is any bookshop amazon or um you can email get in touch with annie at her website which is annie right nailed it nailed it (laughs) thanks so so much (laughs) thank you very much this was such a nice conversation thank you